Well, welcome back. It's, uh, number two or uh, session two. Well, what do you call it? Do you call it a session or no episode? Episode two. Episode two of Uncommon Discipleship. And uh, my name is John Ware, aka the Stuttering Pastor. This is Pastor Ed Arias, aka the Godfather. Yes, sir. And we are back talking about discipleship. That's really the whole heart and goal of this podcast. What we said last week is we want to help people follow Jesus and be discipled by Him. And so today we're gonna, we're going to be talking about like why is discipleship so hard? And I mean, mm. it is you know following you know and and some people say oh following Jesus is not hard. It's really not that difficult. And I'm like okay you you know you you might be different right. But I think for probably a majority of people that follow that follow Jesus, it is. It is hard. I'm gonna right? go. I'm gonna go further. Okay. I'm gonna say that anybody that follows Jesus, right? Yes. And has not encountered any type of struggle. Yes. Is not really following him. Yes. Right. And I mean, you would probably be talking right. <laughs> you know. And so, really, we we just want to talk about like some of what that looks like because, you know, I I really think if if you don't uh, explore and dig. Not just what Jesus said to do, but but some of the variables behind that of why we struggle personally, individually, corporately as the church. Mm. Um, then I, I, you know, then I don't think we're doing our due diligence in wanting to make sure we follow Him. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And um, you know, one of the first things that I was thinking of is how, you know, and, and I and I've said this for a while. But when I read this this book, and like I said last last week, this is such a solid solid book. This just came out in January, and it's I love it because it's a lot of stuff that I've been thinking, and we that we've even been teaching at Lifehouse. Yeah, and he put it into a lot better way than I ever could. But you know, it's not if we are being shaped and formed; it's who or what are we being shaped and formed by. Mm-hmm. So it's not that spiritual formation or discipleship is just the Jesus thing; it's a world thing. Yeah. It's what the world is doing to us. We are always being shaped and formed. And if you're cool with it, I just wanted to read a portion. Of course, go to, ahead. To kind of like set it. Um, this is what it. Um, the John Mark Comer says. He said, spiritual formation happens to everyone, whether they are into it or not. Mother Teresa was a byproduct of spiritual formation. So was Hitler. Gandhi was spiritually formed, as was this dude I never heard of, Charmin Mao. Same with Michelle Obama, Lady Gaga, Br- Brene Brown, Valdemir Zelensky, their spirits have been formed over a long period of time through a complex alchemy of genetic inheritance, family patterns, childhood wounds, education habits, um, uh, decisions, relationships, inner orientations, attitudes, environments, responses to said environments, and more. And then he says, spiritual formation is not optional. Every thought you think, emotion you let shape your behavior, every attitude you let rest in your body, every decision you make, every each word you speak, every relationship you enter into, the habits that make up your days, whether or not you have social media, how you respond to pain and suffering, how you handle failure or success, all these things and more are forming us into a particular shape. Stasis is not on the menu. We are either being transformed into the love and beauty of Jesus or malformed by the entropy of sin and death. We become either agents of God's healing and liberating grace or carriers of the sickness of of the world to believe otherwise is an illusion and to give no thought to this is to become dangerously close to wasting your life. Wow. So no, that was kind of deep starting off the podcast today, but I think it kind of does set, I mean, the complexity, yeah. the depth of what it means to truly follow Jesus. Like is it, you know, because I think we always are like saved or not saved, hot or cold, right? We have these distinctions of, following Jesus and it's so much deeper and and then than just kind of those kind of characterizations. So kind of just from all those thoughts, thoughts, man, what's kind of popping into your head? Man, I, I that was that was pretty deep. Yeah. And I think that you know, And really I think the reason why I said that is because I want us to know the depth and complexity and nuance that I think Jesus had in mind for when we said we we follow him. Heart, mind, soul spirit like he you know it was holistic to him yeah it wasn't just like hey just become a christian it's it's like you are actually inviting into your life he wants to totally totally give you the full treatment like c.s lewis said right and one time or at some time i'll read that quote by him but yeah i mean i think that the first thing that comes to mind is how long it's gonna take come on man because when (laughs) you know it's not something that's gonna happen overnight It's something that we have to be so intentional with that we have to be so aware of ourselves Mm. and know, 
like the things that have discipled us already. You know, the things that that has shaped us already. And I think that's what comes to mind and getting rid of all those things. Or becoming aware. Becoming aware. Self-awareness. <laughs> is key. Is key. It, and a lot of what's formed us is unconscious. Yeah. Like we're not even aware. Yeah. Like even living in the United States. Yeah. Being, how, how that has shaped us. I Your mean, family formation, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's just, it's, it's huge. It's so much. You know, and I think that that mm. th that is the the key thing. And we were we were talking um, off the camera how you know it's it's all about getting to receive the word of God, mm. but also as a church, are we creating an environment for people to actually grow mm. and and face these things? Right, a safe you know? like a safe enough a safe environment. Place. Yes. And even in the preaching, the teaching, and the thing like, are we even helping them become aware of what they're even unconscious of that, that I, has influenced them to be and do one, certain things? One of the biggest things I've seen growing up in church was was how shame was casted from the altar. Mm. You know, you weren't really taught that this is a journey. You mm. weren't really taught that this is something that's going to take time. You know, yes, there are some some miraculous things that happen where somebody is maybe transformed out of maybe an addiction or mm. maybe, but, but when it comes to shaping yourself to be like Christ, there is nothing that says in the Bible that it's going to happen overnight. It's a process. Mm. So why do we expect from the people that are in church to actually just overnight be different? Mm. And I think that as a church, we might not be creating an environment where people feel safe in mm. order to grow, in order to get to know who they are, in order to actually go into God's presence and say, you know what, Lord, through the Bible, mm. you know, and, and seeing really what, what, how they need to die to themselves. Mm. And as a church, having the grace to actually understand that just because somebody else's sin or somebody else's struggle looks different than ours, mm. it doesn't mean that we're not all struggling. Yeah. You know? And I, you know, that word safe. So I, re I remember we were doing a series on church and I put out there, like, what are some things you think the church could be? Or, you know, I mean, I j and, and I just remember the one word that kept on coming was safe. And now, look, I, I know this generation, this generation is characterized as being softer, right? And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, which there might be some truth to that. But I think the generation before us was really hard, was harder, meaning they would not let Jesus into their emotions. Mm. Now I think because of that we have a generation that's gone to the completely other side where now they're dominated by their emotions and by what they feel. So I think when people responded by saying, you know, church should, you know, the the way that that you know, one of the things I think the church needs to work on is becoming safe. I would agree with that, right? But safe doesn't always mean um you're not challenged. Mm. Right? Yeah. Safe does does not always like to me a safe church is where you don't matter where you are, who you are, you walk in, and the first filter we see people through is image of God. Yeah. Image of God, right? So it's it's like the, the first filter isn't, oh, they might be their sexuality, or they're, oh, that's definitely a Republican, or that's definitely a Democrat, <laughs> or that's 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 definitely this. They, like all the other secondary definitions we want to filter people through is this image of God loved by God, right? And 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 then so it's but it's like having a church that views people through that first. But then because it, you know, so what we say at Lifehouse is we have safety with a standard. Right? And it's like I there are times where I've had to fight because I know there are people that have walked into our church that other people have wanted to be like, well, what, 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 you know, and, yeah. and they've wanted yeah. to, well, how can they be in church? How can they be doing this? And and I will fight to be like, hey, you don't know them. You don't know their story. You don't know their background. You don't know their family formation. You don't know the experiences they've had. And until you've actually sat down with them and had, and had a conversation and gotten into the into their life, I don't want to hear nothing. Okay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I'm going to fight to make the church a safe place. Yet there's been conversations where I'm like, hey, you know what? Uh, the theologically, script scripturally, this is where we this is where we stand. Yet you will be safe here to learn about, find, follow. Jesus. Why? Because disciple, mm. just like you said, discipleship takes a long time. Yeah. And what some what Jesus might bring up to somebody in a certain period, it might take eight years. Yeah. But the church can have a hard time with patience because they can want 
you know what I'm saying? We can want results so quick. Yeah, but you know, and also realizing there are things in our lives that have taken eight to ten years for the Lord for us to actually allow the Lord in. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you know what I was going to add to that is is how love challenges. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. and and love is actually patient as well. Mm. So, you mm. know, are we really loving well? And I think that it has a lot to do with with. You know, I, I feel like the church, when it comes to discipleship, unfortunately has taken on the discipleship of of other men or have been influenced by other men mm. more than what really getting to know Christ and being influenced by Christ himself. Mm. The way he did things, the mm. way he walked, the way he moved, the way he, you know, I feel like we have all been influenced. I include myself. There are so many things that kind of shock me you know, within the, the, the American church, mm. when I first came into the American church, you know, a lot of it having to do with reverence, you know, a lot of it having to do with, with even submitting to a pastor. Mm. Cause I see so many people, you know, maybe not being discipled that way. Uh, you know, this, this whole idea of church, um, shopping or hopping, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's something that to me, it's like, it has to, to do you, with this. Like, what the, Cause that has to world? do with discipleship. I was mm. taught to actually, if God wanted me somewhere, you know, even you if you would invite they, Jesus, you'd invite yeah. God into your yeah. church choice. Yes, because it wouldn't what be I like taught. who's the best worship, who's the best preacher, who does the best outreach, who like you know, you would be like, no, God, I want to invite you into this. You know, even if it didn't have a, a, a kids program, right? <laughs> and, and, God and, calls and, me and, here, and, and if I felt like God was calling me here is because mm. He wanted me to actually bring something to the table, you know, to that place, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and <laughs> that's. And, and, and to That's me, that to now. me that has to do with discipleship as well. Mm. You know, being a true discipleship of Christ is actually trying to filter everything through through the lens of the Word of God. Mm. You know, actually inviting God, you know, into our decision making. Mm. And I feel like that is lacking. That's the reason why we have churches that might be too strict or too strong, mm. and th- and they don't have the balance because Christ was somebody that called, you know, Peter. You know, he called him, I rebuke you, right? I rebuke you, devil. You know, Mm -hmm. he wasn't rebuking Peter. He was rebuking the devil in him or Mm -hmm. rebuking, you know, that spirit that was in him at at, at that point. Mm. And I think we have a hard time doing that, separating, you know, things that are uh, um, influenced, separating things that are, have been, you know, somebody grew up with. Mm. We have a hard time separating that from the person. It's really good, you know, because that means you aren't just seeing like what they're doing. You're seeing the variables that have contributed to why they're doing what they're doing. Yes. And instead of saying that's a spirit, you know, it could it could just be, man, like they grew up with this in their home. It's like it it takes discernment and wisdom and relationship in order for there to be like. So, you know, know, going back to to the main point here, like what are the things that are keeping the church? Yeah. From true discipleship. Yeah. And I mean, that's that's a loaded question, you know. And so I, you know, I, I think one of the main things is that, you know, I think we try to put Jesus, like we try to, you know, Jesus said he is a foundation. You're going to build on the rock or you're going to build on the sand. Yeah. Right. And I, I don't think we realize the amount of work it takes to actually uproot the foundation we've already built on or that we've already constructed <laughs> and we try to take the the foundation Jesus the cornerstone and put him on top of all these other things we've built and already constructed mm. right and 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 then we wonder why there's like things are so watered down right like why you know a lot of united states christianity <laughs> you know is mixed with like or, or is it's you know it looks more United States Christian than it does biblical Christian, right? And, but I, I just think be, because like we don't understand how much deconstruction, and I know that's a whatever word, but deconstructing or deformation needs to happen before we can actually like conform or we can be transformed, right? Is we have to deform, right? And the, the, the picture that I get when you yeah. said that, you know how, how there's, how they sell these, these things that, they look like 
something like even even our our, uh-huh. our background right and, yeah. you know it's like you were talking about the rock the foundation right yeah. and i feel like most of the time what we're doing is like we're replacing it by this fake you know temu you know temu <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. This demo version yeah. of of what the rock is supposed to. That's mm. what I envision. You know, yeah. when you were talking about these things, it's like sometimes it may look like we are on the rock, mm. but it's not solid. And I'll be honest, I think a lot of that has to do with preachers, right? Because, and I've even had to repent of this because it, with our heart of wanting to make Jesus attractive mm. and wanting to make Jesus somebody worth following, we kind of water down the commitment. <laughs> wow. We kind of watered down the what it actually means to follow him. So, you know, and you know, you know this. This is language out of our church, right? Like we, you have to know why you're following Jesus. Yeah, he, he can't just be a genie. He can't just be a get out of hell free card, because then you'll use him for your own means instead of realizing he is actually calling you to come and die to your way of living what you deem success as what what you've built your hope on what you've built like it is an actual th- throwing away of what you've built and you're saying Jesus is now going to be the foundation like he's not going to be an add on to my life mm. <laughs> he's not going to be someone that we're that I'm going to throw into all these other things I have adding adding on he's going to be the center he's going to be the foundation so I'm going to reorient my life now around him but i i think if we don't present jesus that way you know or or kind of in in a way that is like jesus will meet you where you are and that's what's amazing about jesus yeah you have a need he'll he'll, he'll most of the time meet you there you like if you have a felt need jesus will meet you there but if we only present him as a meter of felt needs instead of a lord to be worshipped and a king to be submitted to it, then that's where i think it actually, like, that's where it contributes to messed up discipleship because then you're looking at Jesus as how can I be the best version of me? Yeah. <laughs> how can how can I use Jesus to help John become the best version of John instead of, of like, how can more of John die so more of Jesus <laughs> can be can can fill john <laughs> no, you know I, what i'm saying I've, I've, does I've, that make sense yeah it makes a lot of sense yeah. and, I, and i feel like i've heard so many people like within church um they're like god is my daddy which is which is good yes but what is your definition of a daddy what, what is your definition of of what is your he father sugar is? daddy you know what i'm saying <laughs> is he a sugar? It's like you know god is my daddy and you know my daddy loves me and, and yes he loves you but he's also gonna discipline you <laughs> you know <laughs> Come on. He, he he might also talk about spanking you too. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> In the states that is legal. Um, <laughs> but it, you know, it, it's like a father that loves uh, that mm. loves will correct. Mm. You know, and I think that, mm. like you said, a lot of a lot of times we preach about certain things and and we want mm. Christ to be inviting. And I think that he even did that. He was inviting. He also healed people. He also fed people. But it got to that point where he 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 had those masses. Where he he gave the hardest message of 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 them all, where even his disciples were like, "That was too harsh." He's like, "Well, do you want to leave too?" Just like it gets to a point where yes, he's going to invite you. Mm. He's going to invite us. But I think the point here is, you know, how are we going to respond? But but because I, I think Jesus was was getting at what what are you wanting? Yeah. What do you really want from me? Like it was almost he was trying to purify their motives. Mm, that's good, right? He was trying to purify them. He was trying to get down. What? Why are you doing this? Why are you after? And we (laughs) will have those moments, so many of those moments of clarification. Am I following him to use him? Am I following him to get something from him? Or am I really following him to get what his intention really is? Yeah. Yeah. Right, like yeah, like, you know, like John chapter six, like you're talking about. He fed the five thousand. Yeah. A lot of people following him. He said, "Hey, if you don't eat my flesh, drink, drink, drink. You, know, you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no part yeah. of me." This is a hard teaching. Who can accept this? That point, thousands turned around. Yeah, and follow, you know, and turned around. And then he looked at the twelve and said, "Hey, are y'all going to turn away too? To whom shall we go? You got the words of eternal life." That was a moment of them clar- clar- clarifying. I'm not just trying to get your food. I'm just not trying to get your drink. I want the eternal life that you promise and that you offer. Mm. And this is why we see a lot of false conversions. And well, and and I don't really believe they're like, 
I just believe that when you get down to why people follow, Jesus wants to get to the root of that. It even goes down to like the, you know, what you were talking about earlier, which is, you know, the parable of the seed. Yes. Right? Where the seed's the word of God. Mm -hmm. And it gives four different environments, soils. Yeah. Right? And how one soil was like, it wasn't, you know, it was like on the top of the thing and the devil came and stole it. You're going to have to help me out here. You know more of the Bible than I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the second one, uh, was it three or four? Anyway, it's like, yeah, I, yeah, it was I know one was like, you know, choked, you know, one, it was choked out by, it was, I mean, he used that word choke. Like the word of God was choked out by the worries of life and the yeah. deceitfulness of riches. Mm. <laughs> You know, but then there was one seed that fell on good soil. And I just think if there is a cultural United States soil that we have that most of the time happens is the word of God gets choked <laughs> by the worries of life and the deceitfulness of riches. Mm. And, and and it doesn't bear fruit, you know. And, you know, and, and, I, and I feel like it, it happens when... Because when we when we talk about through uh, real discipleship and and really following God, um, I mean God has to actually become your everything, right? Mm. At least that foundation needs to be there. Where you know it's going to take time, like a reorientation. Yes, Jesus becomes the center. Yes, because if if not, you're going to find your security on your job. You're going to find your security on, you know your 401k you're gonna find your security on on, on so many other things mm. you know except for god himself mm. and i think you know when it comes to me i'm like lord you know i, I told god help me see you as the creator of the universe mm. as the creator of everything because i mm. think that helped me with my discipleship mm. with my personal walk with god when i see god as the creator of everything and i know that everything mm. shall pass but his word Mm. It gives me a better perspective into what am I really investing my time in? Mm. What am I becoming? Mm. And 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 at the end of the road, where am I gonna be? Because mm. we all have to have You're to know. You're being formed. You're being shaped. You're being, being formed. formed. It's like we have to make a conscious decision of who am I becoming? Am mm. I becoming more like Christ, or am I becoming more of me, or more of the world? You know. And, and even doing that in this culture requires time. It requires yes. time in God. It requires time in God's presence. It requires self-reflection, like honest self-reflection for you to really take inventory and to allow the Holy Spirit to say, to put his finger on some things, right? You know, I heard Mark, Mark Batterson say, like, many people want the Holy Spirit's com comfort, want the Holy Spirit's direction right they want all of these benefits from the holy spirit but no one wants the holy spirit's conviction mm. and he said you can't have you can't have one without the other you can't want his comfort without also his conviction right and i just think we kind of plug our ears right and you know yeah. um to those things that maybe we might not want to see <clears throat> you know and um but you know as you were talking i started thinking about the difference between the paul that paul makes he talks about the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow, right? Of, of kind of how that moment where we're making a decision to follow Jesus. And I think what you see in the church many times is that it's a worldly sorrow because what Paul says is that godly sorrow leads to repentance. Mm. Worldly sorrow is kind of that feeling of like, I feel bad for what I've done, but it's not going to actually lead to change. Godly sorrow is like, I understand I have sinned against creator. I have sinned against transcendence. I have sinned against somebody so beyond me. And so my response is going to be a turning, a repentance, right? And even that mm. word repent, you know, we talk a lot. We'll, we'll probably yeah. have a whole session on repentance yes, because it's such a powerful word because like repentance isn't just feeling bad. It's rethinking, mm -hmm. rethinking everything, <laughs> Right. It's it's it. And you just think of the implications of that in discipleship where so you're rethinking every area of your life according to what Jesus and his word has to say about it. So you're inviting him into your sexuality. You are inviting into him into your finances. You're inviting him into your emotions and you're asking him, say, like, I'm going to rethink, take out the foundation that I've built or that the world has told me to have. And I'm going to rebuild it on what Jesus and his word 
says, you know. That's good. That's yeah. good. And like, you know, one of the things that I, I want to bring up is, you know, at a church we say we're not, we're not mm. trying, we're training, you know. There's a lot of people that have used that. And I think the original maker of that was either Dallas Willard. I think it was Dallas Willard. Jesus uh, was the original man. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, but I'm talking about in the kind of the kind of how it's kind of just like taken, you know, taken forms, you know. But it's it's it yeah, it's the whole idea of trying and, and trying over train or training over trying. And the main example they get is when you're running a marathon. Yeah. So you wouldn't go from the couch to run twenty six point two. You can't. He says you you could try all day, but if you're eating Pepsi or you're drinking Pepsi and Doritos, you know, you're eating Doritos, drinking Pepsi, eating Taco Bell. And you try to get up one day and try to run that trash. Is it? Is it, let me ask you something. Yeah. Is it that people forget where they come from? Because I feel like the saints, you know, mm. it's like we're at church and the saints, like you said, they might see somebody walking through the door, and then next week they see them serving, and instead of being happy mm. because that person is serving, they actually see the flaws of that person. Like they didn't have flaws back in the day, and they still have flaws, and they're still working through certain things. Mm. It's like. Is it that we forget? That we forget that, or you know, it's like we need to give what we've received and it's mm. grace, mm. it's patience, it's love, empathy, you know? Mm. I mean, it's just like me, you know, I just turned 40. You're 30. I'm going to be 38. 38. Yeah, yeah. I've, I mean, I've got a 12-year-old, soon to be 13. I, I'm like, I think I forget what I was like when I was 12 <laughs> going to 13 years old. And I react many times thinking he's more mature than he is. Yeah. Then he should be more disciplined and he should, you know, want to do his chores and he should want to be a part of the household and want to, you know, and I think I forget that. I forget what it was like. And I think in the same way, many saints, many people forget what they were like who, when, yeah. when they first started to follow Jesus. And, um, I mean, I think there is always some of that, like, spiritual amnesia, I think we'll call it, yeah. right? Yeah. Is we don't remember. We don't remember. We have a tendency to forget what we should remember and remember what we should forget, you know? Mm. And so I just, you know, and and that that's why I think shepherds are so important, right? Because, like... Problems are easier from far away. Yeah. They just are, right? So you can fix everything if you're far away and you're barking orders. When you're walking side by side with somebody mm. and you're in their life and you are hearing the backstories, you are hearing the parental experiences they've had, you are hearing the abuse that's been done to them. You are hearing how people have taken advantage of them. Like you, you are actually walking with the sheep. Like one of the things they is, is like you smell like the sheep. <laughs> you yeah. actually smell like them. Mm -hmm. I, I've just seen there's so much lack of grace if you're not smelling like the sheep. If you're that's walking true. with the sheep and you're smelling them and, and you smell like them, man, you you have a lot more grace. What I've just seen is the people that are the most like mean and not understanding and lack empathy, it's those who have distance. Yeah. And many times when you ask them, who are you discipling? You know what they say? Uh, yeah. Because when you get in it, number one, you disciple somebody, you're in their life, it's going to expose something in you. Many times those people don't even have grace for themselves. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they're just exerting or throwing that grace, that lack of grace on someone else because it gets the eyes off of them. Yeah. So any, anyway, I, I know I just took that a little, no, that's little good. long. But that was good because I, I, I could see that happening with it changes when it's somebody close to them. When it's their son, mm. when it's their daughter, when it's somebody close <laughs> to them, it changes. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. Oh, give them a chance. You know, they they, they want to serve, but that might be the only thing that's keeping them here at church right now. Mm. You know, let them serve. Or mm. or if they're in a in a in a within sin and mm. they worship, no, but let them worship because that's the only thing that's getting them to through this season. Mm. It's like it's different when it's close to home. But I think that's the reason within discipleship that Christ wanted us to understand, and is that 
we are a body. Mm. And if the pinky is hurting, come on. We need to do, do something to help the pinky out. Yeah. Yeah. Like actually feel that we're one body. Mm. Feel that we're that we're one. Mm. That's why he says that, that they sh- they shall know that that they are my church. They should know that they are when they are one, just as me and you, the Father, are one. Mm. You know? Yeah. So it's like true. And he's the chief shepherd. I mean, he calls himself the chief shepherd. Yes. The chief shepherd smells like his sheep. <laughs> yeah. That's what he got bashed for. Man, this dude hangs with sinners. Did not sin. So, and y'all coming at me. It's, 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 it's like he was the influencer. He wants the one being influenced. But that's the risk you take when you want to smell like your sheep. And you actually want to show an example. And you actually want to not just tell them what to do, but actually show them what to do. And, you know, I just, I, I just think we can, we can kind of like put a bow on this here, you know, is I'm just so glad we have a chief shepherd. Yeah. We have a great high priest, Hebrew says, um, that knows what it's like, you mm-hmm. know, for, you know, we have a great high priest who does not know what it's like, you know, or, or who knows what it's like. He empathize. I mean, even there's some translations that say he can empathize with our weaknesses. Yeah. And this says, since then, um, let us run to the throne of grace in our time of need to receive mercy because he's been there, you know. And I just, you know, so grateful in this process of discipleship and following him. I heard Bill Gauthier say one thing that shook, that was powerful when he was talking about discipleship in Jesus. He said Jesus was the first follower. Mm. Jesus was the first disciple. Yeah. He was a disciple of his father. I go where the father tells me to go. I say what the father tells tell, tells me to say. I teach what the father tells me to teach. These are the intimate details in the book of John. Yeah, where it's it, where he was so locked in. Why? Because he was an apprentice. He was a follower of his of his father, and that's an that, that's an example for us. And then we are his followers, right? So. You know, and 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 so I I just love the fact of we we're not following somebody that doesn't know what it's like to be us, doesn't know what it's like to struggle. He knows what it's like to struggle. He overcame. He showed us what was possible through a life filled with the same Holy Spirit that he had. Yep. But governed by a life of discipline and governed by a life of rhythms. He got close. Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. He got close. Come on. So. Anybody out there? Let's get close. Yeah. Let's let's get right. close to people. Come and on. let's let's disciple people the right way. Come on. So episode two done, baby. We appreciate you, man. Hey. We'll be back. Episode three. Some point soon. We'll see y'all then. <laughs>